Hey ya, welcome back to another video. Thank you for joining me today. As always, I hope you're keeping well. So I'm going to be talking you through the top 10 horror novels that I read in 2023. So out of the 52 books that I read in 2023, I think 31 or 32 of them were horror novels. So we had a lot of contenders, but I managed to whittle it down to just 10 books. And I just want to chat about them. I just want to recommend them and stuff. The first book is Things We Say in the Dark by Kirsty Logan. Now, this initially was very off-putting to me. So I picked it up. I read the first short story in it. I didn't really understand it. It was certainly weird. And it was just too weird for me in that moment. I was like, I, you know, I don't have the patience to read something like this at the moment. So I ended up putting it down and it ended up being the last book that I read in 2023. And I ended up like binging through this like a few days before the end of the year because I enjoyed it so much. And I really appreciated and understood what people said when they compare Kirsty Logan's writing style to like Shirley Jackson and Angela Carter. There's this like weird fairy tale esque vibe to them. There's just a lot of like really introspective thoughts explored within it. They're not horrific. They're not like super, super scary or anything like that. But it definitely focuses more on the weird, more on the darker side of like the human psyche and all that sort of thing. If you are into kind of like dark fairy tale vibes, if you're into stories that kind of focus around womanhood and motherhood and all that sort of thing, definitely pick it up. The next book that I read was another short story collection. I got this from the library at the time. It was a bit of a hidden gem to be perfectly honest because I picked it up not really knowing much about it and it ended up completely blowing me away. It's Dead Relatives by Lucy McKnight Hardy. I had this like weird feeling that it was like written for someone like me. It had everything that I really enjoy in horror. It had these like twisty moments in it and um, I really couldn't see from start to finish like where the story was going to go. Um, so it focuses on a little girl called Iris and she lives with her mother in like this countryside house and it's just her mother and the servants and then all these photos in the family home of all her dead relatives. One day three women come to stay in the house and they're there for a very specific reason but because Iris is little she doesn't really understand and she ends up really befriending one of the women and her mother is like giving her strict instructions like you can't talk to these women don't be annoying them. Luckily for Iris this woman takes a lot of interest in her too and she's just super sweet and stuff. You go into it and you're just like okay we're going through like a child's perspective on things and you know there's a lot of nuance to it because you've obviously got like the main thing that's going on within the story that the child isn't necessarily privy to. And then there's other things in it that the child is kind of privy to and you're just like, this is horrifying. My jaw was on the floor by the time I'd finished it and the rest of the stories within the collection are excellent as well. But I have to say that just that first story just really blew me away because it was, oh, it was just exactly what I needed in that moment. You know what I mean? I was just so grateful to have decided to pick it up. And this year I'm definitely going to be picking up her full length novel. I think it's called like The Water Shall Refuse Them or something like that. It seems like it's going to have like similar vibes, similar themes and stuff. And I just, I really enjoyed her writing style. It was very Shirley Jackson-esque. But Lucy McKnight Hardy is definitely an author who I'm going to be putting on my automatically reading list. Coming in at number eight is The Whistling by Rebecca Netley. Now, I didn't really go into this with much expectations. I'd read a few reviews of it online and I decided to get it out of the library. I am so glad that I did because I loved this. This was an absolute binge read for me. It follows a young nanny called Elspeth and she's called to work at this Scottish island in this manor. Um, she's going to be taking care of a young girl called Mary who hasn't spoken since the mysterious death of her twin brother William. Their previous nanny just left in the middle of the night. People don't know whether she left of her own accord or if she's something's happened to her and she's disappeared. The aunt in charge of Mary does not want the death of William spoken about. She doesn't want William spoken about at all. The servants are very cold towards Elspeth. Like at a certain point Elspeth believes that they might be out to get her. And she's trying to unravel the mystery of what happened to William in order to help Mary prosper and, you know, try to make a connection with her, try to bond with her, try to make her feel like she's safe. And there's a lot of weird, unsettling things that are happening within this house, especially at nighttime. There's just so much mystery and atmosphere wrapped up in this like twisty, turny novel. And it was just one of those books that I could just completely get wrapped up in and enjoy the journey of it. This book was just so atmospheric. It was really gripping 
And I just, again, it's another book that I flew through because I was like, I need to know what happens at the end. I need to know what's going on and like what happened to William. It's definitely one of those books that you could read during the autumn over a stormy night and just you could definitely read it in one sitting if you were that invested in doing so. Obviously, it's not a masterpiece or anything like that, but it's enjoyable for what it is. And sometimes you just really need those kind of books in your life um, to keep you motivated, to keep you going, to keep you guessing and all that sort of thing. So yeah, I can't recommend The Whistling enough if you enjoy gothic horror. Coming in at number seven is Slade House by David Mitchell. This is a book that I got out from the library in 2023 and obviously I enjoyed it so much I had to pick up a physical copy for myself. This is set in five different time periods and it's basically five different chapters and it focuses on Slade House, which is a peculiar house to say the least. It seems that it only appears to certain people at certain times and you have to go down this little dark alleyway and you'll have to find this small iron door within a brick wall and once you enter this iron door it leads into this magnificent garden and you end up walking up into Slade House. So Slade House is occupied by these two siblings, a brother and a sister, and they tend to invite people to the house every nine years for various different reasons. Sometimes it's like a little party, a little get together. Other times it's because the person is looking for something. They might be lonely. They might be a bit alienated in their life. And the brother and sister will invite them in. You know me, I love kind of like haunted house storylines. I love when the house itself is basically a character in the novel. And this really exceeded my expectations. I didn't really know anything about David Mitchell's writing style. I didn't really know anything about the actual story of it. There was something strange about the writing that just really resonated with me in such a way that it made me kind of feel nostalgic. I don't know why. The actual elements of horror in it I thought were spectacular and just the unraveling of the truth of like the mystery of Slade House. Once I actually got to the bottom of it, it was just such a bigger story than I had anticipated. I have this weird feeling that like I already want to reread it, like I just want to experience the story all over again and I feel like that never really happens to me. Once I read a book I'm like okay it's done but this kind of had that effect on me of like I just want to, I want to re-experience it even if I know what happens in the end, especially in the run-up to Halloween, I think this would be a great read. Coming in at number six is Hell House by Richard Matheson. So this is a book that I procrastinated on reading for years. Early-ish 2023, I was really craving reading like haunted house horror, like horror house sort of stuff. I had recently picked this up and I was like, okay, I'll give this a go and hopefully it will quench that thirst in me. And by the time I finished it, even though I had my problems with it, there was moments in it that I didn't particularly like. There's a bit of like ye old misogyny in it. You kind of roll with the punches at certain times because it's just like, I suppose it is a somewhat of a gothic trope. You kind of have to put up with it, even though I was like, this isn't really relevant to the story. I feel like the author's just talking about titties for the sake of it. Initially, the story follows an eccentric millionaire who wants to discover if there's life after death because he's in the process of dying and obviously he's very scared by it and he wants to know this isn't the end for him. And he decides to send in a team of investigators to this very notorious alleged haunted house. People have gone in to investigate it before, years prior, and they've never come out. There was only one person who was able to survive it, and he is one of the people who this millionaire has enlisted to go back in, because the way it's viewed is that he knows what to expect. So initially the story does really build up that dread of like what is to come, what are we going to be expecting, what type of horrors are we going to see in this hell house. There were specific moments that just made the hairs on my arms stand up that just really creeped me out that even if I think about now I still get that like tense sort of like on edge feeling. I just feel like it really delivered on what I expected a haunted house tale to do. It just was a completely solid horror novel. I enjoyed the creepiness of it so much and the lore of the house and the, the history of the things that had happened there and all that sort of thing. So if you have not read Hell House yet, give it a go. Coming in at number five is some more classic horror. This is a book that took me so long to finally get around to reading but I finally read The Hellbound Heart by Clive Barker and I found this edition in a charity shop last year and it was like, it was has to be like my favourite find of 2023 because I think it's so cool. It's like probably the only film edition of a book that I've actually 
enjoyed <laughs> that I think is you know really pretty and stuff. I felt like it was in this charity shop specifically for me because it was time for me to finally read the damn book. So I had seen the film adaptation to this previously and I tend to if I see the film adaptation of a book I tend to procrastinate on actually reading the book because I want to be able to kind of forget the film a bit before reading the book. I just have to give myself a little bit of time in between the things. Like I can never be a person who like reads a book and then immediately watches the film or vice versa. This follows a man called Frank who is a bit of an arsehole. Uh, no, do you know, I'd say he's a complete arsehole. He feels that he has experienced all the pleasures of the world and he just wants more because he's a greedy dickhead. And he hears about this box that supposedly when you solve this puzzle box that it will open up, you will be taken to a universe to experience like all these unknown pleasures. This immediately appeals to Frank. He gets his hand on the puzzle box. He ends up solving the puzzle box and what comes out of it once he's solved it are these beings that are referred to in the book as Cinnabites. So they're basically these like androgynous beings. They were like once human, but they have been so long in this other dimension, this other world that they don't know the difference between pain and pleasure. Their bodies are like incredibly like lacerated and just it's it's unimaginable like looking at them. They've basically turned into demons because they're really their human side is just really no longer there. And Frank realizes like, oh no, I done fucked up. <laughs> and he ends up being taken back to this other world. And the thing is Frank's actually having an affair with his brothers wife and she ends up being able to kind of bring him back into the world bit by bit and um you know she believes that he loves her and he'll do anything for her so she'll do anything for him it was just such an entertaining read it's only like 120 pages or so and it always really impresses me when i go back and and i read certain horror classics and especially like when it comes to novellas it's amazing like how much of a story can be packed into like such a small thing and how like influential certain stories can become and like the ripple effect of that influence. Um, that's something that always like really, really interests me when it comes to horror, you know, like where certain subgenres came from, um, where authors get specific, you know, inspiration from and all that sort of thing. And going back and reading like certain horror authors, like favorite horror books or like the books that inspired them. This was a long time coming and I definitely, definitely want to read more of Clive Barker's books because like the body horror in this was fantastic. And it's like, I kind of knew what to expect, but I was still shocked by it. I was still really impressed by it. I'm definitely going to be picking up more Clive Barker in the future. I feel like I wasn't even like a true horror fan until I actually read this. It's a really fast paced story. You'll definitely blow through it in an hour or two. And yeah, then you've read like one of the all time classics of classics in horror. Coming in at number four is The Creeper by A.M. Shine. Now this is probably a bit bumped up my list because it's an Irish author and it's an Irish setting. And am I biased to those types of things? Absolutely. Um, but I found the story to be like super enjoyable. It's kind of one of those books that reminds me of like why I love reading horror so much because like sometimes it's just so fun and like you don't have to get like all critical and deep about things and analyzing this and what was the author trying to say with that. Sometimes there doesn't have to be a whole huge social commentary. There doesn't have to be a whole huge takeaway from a book. Sometimes you just read it because it's fun and it's enjoyable. And that's what this was for me. This follows Dr. Sparling, who is this very bizarre kind of shut in academic. And he ends up hiring two people right out of college to go on this trip for him. He wants them to investigate this really remote little village and he's specifically sending them to investigate it because of the local folklore. The village is just shut off and completely isolated. And once the two team members actually get there, they realize that this whole thing might have been just a massive mistake because even though they are being paid very, very generously to go out of the way on this quest for this professor, they don't know if they're actually going to be able to get what they need in order to write this academic paper for Dr. Sparling because the people there do not want to talk to them. They're very cold to them. They're very like sus of them and they they are just like you should have never come here at first it's so irritating because you're just like okay what's going on i want to know what's going on so ben and chloe who are the team members discover that this remote village goes into lockdown at sundown and they're not allowed to look out their windows and they learn from a little girl about this creature referred to as the creeper and initially if you see him he'll be really really far away 
And then if you happen to see him on the second night, he'll be a little bit closer. And then on the third night, you don't even want to know what's going to happen. They're very kind of like weirded out by it, but they don't really take it seriously until they end up getting home and they're working on this paper together. Do they accidentally happen to come across the creeper one night? And they realise that they may have taken this curse from this village back with them. If you're into the idea of like curses and urban legends and that's like the type of horror that you really enjoy, this is definitely a book that you would probably really, really like. Coming in at number three is Mary by Nat Cassidy. This was fantastic. This really lived up to my expectations of it based on the reviews that I had seen of it. So this follows Mary and as we are reading about her, we learn that she is being let go from her job as a bookseller. In this time period, she also learns that her aunt is very sick and that she needs someone to look after her and her cousin's away for the time being. So Mary is basically tasked with going back to her hometown to look after her aunt. And once she gets there, she's, you know, very anxious about it. She was always like a misfit when she was younger. She didn't really have any friends and she hopes that people don't really remember her or they don't judge her based on who she was back then. Because, you know, it's like a very small town, small sort of hive mind mentality that goes on there. Mary also has other things going on. So she's middle aged. She's going through menopause. And for the last while, every time she looks in a mirror, she sees her face starting to decay and just wither away. And it's just like a horrifying vision that she keeps having. So she avoids mirrors at all costs. But this isn't the only weird thing that's happening to her. Ever since she's gotten back to her hometown, she starts seeing apparitions of dead women. These are women who are potentially all murder victims from a serial killer and they all have a very specific look to them. They all have pillowcases over their heads. They're all bloody. And it's a really kind of like horrifying thing that she's witnessing. And she doesn't know why specifically she is witnessing it. She doesn't know if these women are coming to her for help. And I just thought this was such an interesting read. And it didn't really necessarily go the way that I had anticipated in my head based on reading synopsis that I had but I still really enjoyed it. I was like, okay, this isn't taking the turn that I thought it would. It's actually going completely in a different direction, but I still like this subgenre, so I'm not going to complain. I thought the writing was excellent. I thought that, you know, again, it's one of those horror novels that just really, really delivered for me. I was trying to like map out, okay, like this is definitely what's going to go on, or this is definitely the reason as to why Mary's seeing these women. And I was completely wrong. Like, I was completely wrong by the time I got to the end of it. But you know what? The journey was fun. If you haven't read Mary and you like kind of like serial killer, slashery, um, weirdness, yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> Coming in at number two is Brother by Anya Alburn. I was under the impression that it kind of leans into more sort of extreme horror after reading it. I definitely say it doesn't. I would say that the actual horror and the gore and um, the killings and stuff that happen within this really do take a backseat to the actual horror of like what's going on in the story with this family. So this follows 19 year old Michael. He is a member of the Morrow family and um, they live in the Appalachian Mountains. They're very far away from anyone. They live in this like rundown farmhouse and they are also cannibals. Michael is very against this, but he has his role to play in it. And he just dreams of getting out one day. He feels like he just does not fit in with his family. He's constantly bullied by his older brother, who seems like an absolute psychopath. And um, his mother is not much better. On an off chance, Michael ends up meeting a girl at a record store as his brother drives him into the town one day. And he realizes that like maybe he does actually have a chance in getting out and living a normal life. And obviously, you know, she can't find out what he's been up to all these years and what his family is like. And obviously he has to keep her well away from his family because, you know, they might be hungry. I think out of everything that I read in 2023, this is probably the book that I was most invested in. This is the book that I had the most like visceral reaction to when I was reading those last couple of pages before it finally ended. And I, I just could not believe what I was reading. And I was just, I just felt like the ending was perfect. Like it was an ending that I found really satisfying, despite the fact that I was like shaking the book and shouting no, as we were getting closer and closer to it. It really did just deliver on the kind of horror that I like. And obviously we're leading with the whole cannibal family. Obviously there's blood and gore in it. Obviously they're kidnapping like hitchhikers and people who they don't think will be missed. 
in order to make a nice meal out of them. That really wasn't the main horror. I suppose like the main sort of horror of the story is this really wicked family dynamic, how abusive they all are, how soulless they all are, and this like generational trauma that the mother has that she inflicts on her children and just how like weirdly desensitized they are to everything. I really liked that element. I really liked the fact that it wasn't one of those books that shocks you with like certain kills or how much blood and how much gore there could be. How it really shocked you and how it frightened you was just the lengths that these characters would go through in order to get one over on somebody else. But yeah, if you have any recommendations as to where do I go from here with reading more Anya Alburn, um, let me know because definitely, definitely a new favourite. And then finally, the first place had to absolutely go to this book. There was no other way. And I knew it when I read it at the time. I was like, this is going to be my top horror read of the year because I don't see how anything else could one up it basically and it had to be Ring Shout by P. Clark. It had the social commentary, it had the actual horror, it had incredible body horror, it had an incredible message to it, it had characters that you could really get behind and want them to you know win the good fight. Um, it just had like everything. It was just a perfect story. So the story follows our main character Maurice who is a resistance fighter. And what she's fighting, not everyone actually can see. It follows the hatred of the KKK and the hatred that they spread. They're actually creating something much, much bigger. They're birthing these basic hell demons and only Marie's and people like her can see them. And it's down to her and her group of resistance fighters to kill them in order to try to stop the spread of the hate, in order to try to contain it. And as we go through the story, we learn of this villain called Butcher Clyde and oh my god. I feel like it's been a really long time since I've read a book that just has a straight up villain who exists just to be a villain. Like there is no redemption story for this being. There's there's nothing. There's a reason he's called a butcher and the body horror that stems from that is probably some of the best not only that I've read even to compare to films. I feel like it's some of the best body horror that I've ever ever been able to experience because it is just so grotesque and so horrifying and just so well written that you can just perfectly imagine it. And considering this is another book that's really quite short, I feel like it's under 200 pages or so, it packs so much into it. There is a lot of social commentary there, but it's done so, so well. And like horror has always been a conduit to talk about social issues. Like even if you go back as far as like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, what the director was trying to do with that film was to show how we don't have, we don't really care about how animals are butchered, but when it comes to humans being butchered and put on meat hooks and things like that, we take issue with it and just the contradiction within that. If you're going to read one book out of these 10 books, please make it ring shout because it was absolutely incredible. Anyone who you've heard talk about it and praise it, they're not wrong. I can absolutely guarantee that you're going to enjoy it regardless of the heavy issues that are being brought forward because it is a straight up horror novel. It does not miss a beat when it comes to the horror in it and it will just have you gripped from the very first page. So those are my top 10 favourite horror novels of 2023. Let me know if you've read any of them and what your thoughts are on them and of course let me know your favourite horror novels that you read in 2023 and if there's anything you're looking forward to reading in 2024 as well. If you want to keep up with me outside of YouTube, you can always follow me on my Instagram and TikTok where I make kind of short form bookish content that doesn't really make it into full length videos. And as always, I hope you enjoy this video and I will talk to you soon. Goodbye.